Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, and I'll be reading verses 1 through 9, and this is what it says. Now on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered and said to them, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other sinners because they suffered this fate? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and killed were worse culprits than all the men who lived in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he began telling them this parable. A certain man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. And he said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? And he answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. But if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. Pray with me. Jesus, this day it's yours. And you say where two or more are gathered in your name that you're here. Not because of our goodness, but because of yours. Enter into this time called worship. That we may have eyes that see and ears that hear. Your voice in your hand. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. It was just about 112 years ago. I was a senior in college at LaGrange College. I was a religion and philosophy major, and I had my plan set. I knew what I was going to do. I was going to go through school, and, and after I graduated from college, I was going to go to seminary at Emory, and then I was going to get my first church. Well, that's not exactly the way that it happened. That was my plan, but the district superintendent at LaGrange District called the head of the department down there at LaGrange College and said, do you have a senior you think might want a church? And would you be willing to interview for it? Well, I went and I interviewed. and I was appointed to my first church while I was still in college. And the average age of the church was about 76 or 77. I, that, and that was my youth group. I mean, they got a lot older than that from there. There was one woman in that church that had a, a great grandson that was older than I was. <laughs> they were incredibly gracious fine people and very forgiving. Oh, yeah, that, uh, I know I preached some stinkers, but they were, they were wonderfully gracious people. I was there for three years, and then I went to my first church after I graduated from seminary. And this was a, what kind of, in a small town out in the middle of nowhere. And I got to be friends with the Episcopal priest in that town. He and I had a lot of the same interests, and one of those interests was cars. We liked cars, we just didn't have a lot of money. 
So we decided we'd pitch in our money and we bought ourselves an MGB convertible. Uh, it, if you know much about cars, you know that an MG is not much of a car. Uh, but we had it. It was convertible and I'd get it one week and he'd get it the next. And, and usually on my week, what, what I would do is, is I would take this, this great big loop out into the country and come back into town. I'd put the top down, put the music on loud, and, and after work every day, that's, that's the loop I would make every week that I had my, my portion of the car. Well, this particular day, I was, I was going on that great big loop, and they'd closed the road coming back into town, so I turned around to go back the way I came. And after I turned around, it, it didn't take long at all. I, it's, it sounded like somebody was honking their horn from the back seat of my car. Well, I looked in the rearview mirror. Sure enough, the, there was a truck that was so close, I, all I could see was the grill of the truck. I couldn't tell what kind it was. And they were just laying on their horn. And they began to pull around me and... There were three of the biggest human beings God ever breathed breath into, crammed into the front seat of that pickup truck. And it, they looked like Superman's older brothers. And the, the passenger was banging on the side of the truck. And he said, pull over. What? I was in an MG. There was no way I was going to outrun them. So I pulled over. That's when the driver began to get out. And I say began to get out because he was so big, it took him a while. I mean, he was huge. He, he, he was carved out of a single piece of granite, and he, came, and he was mad. He came back, he started cussing at me, calling me everything, but a child of God said that I was showing off that my car had thrown up a rock and had busted his windshield, and I said, if I busted your windshield, I'll pay for it. So I, I reached in my pocket, and I pulled out my wallet, and I gave him all the money I had. It was, it was about $30, and... He took the $30, he put it into his pocket, and when he pulled his hand back out of his pocket, he had a gun. He hooked the gun up under my jaw and pushed me over in the seat. And he just kept poking me with that gun, said, I'm going to blow your head off. You busted my windshield. You were just showing off. I said, no, if I was showing off, I wouldn't have stopped my car. Well, that made him pause a little bit put the gun back in his pocket and then he stepped back and he said get out of the car I'm going to stomp you all over the highway well I think I came up to his waist I might have come a little past his waist but not much at all so when he said I'm going to stomp you all over the highway I looked at him in the eye and I said you could probably do it well, I don't think he was accustomed to hearing that. I, I think he was a little more accustomed to bar fights. You know, you push and the other person pushes back and then it's fight. I just said, I, uh, yeah, the, the, the safe bet is on you that you could stomp me all over the highway. Uh, so uh, he paused a little bit and he said, get out. I want you to see what you did to my windshield. So I got out and I went up and sure enough there was one of those little bitty chinks on his windshield looked like you know an asterisk or something about the size of a, a large gnat and it, it yes it had it had busted his windshield and then he said you know you don't understand my baby had to go without and I just put in a windshield and you showing off and you busted and I said I know thirty dollars isn't enough to pay for a windshield so why don't you give me your name and address and I'll send you more money that's it. he said no you'll call the law on me I said, I, I probably might not maybe do that. I said, just give me your name and address. He said, no, do you have a business card? Well, I had to think about it for a minute. This woman in my church, had, had, part of what she did for a living is she, she printed up business cards and she gave me 500 business cards with my name on it. And I, I had never used one of them, but I did put it in the, the coat pocket that I was wearing and I, I said sure so I gave it to him and and it said Reverend Thomas C. Davis on there now I want to kind of set the stage for you I, I was 25 years old but I looked like I was 12 so I grew a mustache so I looked like a 12 year old with a mustache and he looked at my business card and he said are you Reverend Davis I said yes he said, I didn't know you were with the church. I said, yes. And then this big tear welled up in the corner of his eye. And, and he said, God's been working on my temper. Well, 
<laughs> I'm thinking, wow, you mean it was worse before? I, that, <laughs> I, I would have thought God could have done a little better job than that, but it was worse before. I, I, and he said, preacher, I want you to pray for me. And I said, buddy, I've been praying for you and me both from the time you stepped out of your car. He said, I know you must have been because I was going to, I was going to. And then he broke down crying. And I said, I know you were going to. And, and we stood on the side of the road, prayed together. And then he got in his truck and he drove off. Now, I don't know if you knew that that doesn't happen to me every week. Sometimes a whole month will go by and that somebody doesn't pull a gun on me and and, and, and push me over in the seat. And, and so it found a way to work its way into my sermon that Sunday. As a matter of fact, it worked its way into my conversation. And it worked on me every day from that moment on for a long time after that. But it worked its way into my sermon. And this is a good church, good people, fine people, very gracious people, wonderful people. But the number one comment after that sermon, and it wasn't just one or two or three or ten people, it was again and again and again and again. The number one comment was, what were you doing there? Do you hear what's implied? What were you doing there? Do you hear it? What's implied is that bad things don't happen to good people. That, that you must have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. You, you must be to blame. Somebody here is to blame. You must have done something. Yeah, evil, it, it, it doesn't brush up against all of us unless we're in the wrong place at the wrong time or we've done the wrong thing. Do you hear it? Jesus addresses that. People come to him with an event that had happened. An event, a, a current event that right there in his own day that, that there were these worshipers going from Galilee to the temple in Jerusalem. Well, it's a long walk and they were going to, to offer their praise and sacrifice to God. If ever there were something noble and righteous, that's it. They're, they're making their way from Galilee to, to the temple. And Pilate slaughtered them, killed them, and mingled their own blood with their own sacrifices. Evil is what that is. That's just plain evil. And so Jesus says, do you suppose these were the worst sinners in all of Galilee? In other words... Do you, you, you've turned your eyes toward evil and you're, you're certain that there must be evil response and, and they were taking part in it in some way. And Jesus has a quick answer for that and that answer is no. I tell you no. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What a curious response, unless you repent. Unless you repent that our natural inclination is when evil happens. It's to turn our, our eyes away from God and turn toward evil. And we get transfixed by evil. And we tend to, to react to the evil, sometimes in anger and sometimes in despair. But we, we react to evil with evil and because evil is all we see when we turn toward it. And Jesus says, I tell you, no, repent. Turn toward God. I think this is what Harry Emerson Fosdick was talking about. When he was talking about there's some things that, that, that God won't do for us, but he won't do without us. That there's some things in this world that God won't do for us, but he won't do without us. And one of those things is God won't think for us. But he won't think without us. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, your mind, and your strength. That God didn't write, 
formulas in the clouds or, or even the direction of our lives on clouds or on a, a, a fortune cookie that we don't have to think, that we don't have to turn toward God, that to do God's will in this world where evil is real, where suffering is real, where heartache is real, that we have to turn toward God and we have to think. Well, it's happened again. Evil. Evil. And Uvalde, to Texas. Evil. It's real. Evil. And Buffalo, New York. Evil. Right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Methodist minister doing what God had called her to do. Murdered with a butter knife and dumped evil. And our tendency is to to turn toward the evil and react and not think. Our our tendency is to turn at somebody here. We we need to point to if somebody is at fault. Somebody is the cause of this. Or despair. Despair. And retreat. And, and, and when we are transfixed by evil, those are about the only responses that we have. Is anger, reaction, and despair. But to love God with heart, soul, and mind means that together, together, we listen. We, some people are saying, they, they, they don't think and pray. We don't need thoughts and prayers. We need action. But it's not only the thinking. There's some things that God won't do for us, but he won't do without us. Working is another one of those things. Thinking and, and working. That that God never made a, 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 a jet engine or a needle, but he did fill the mountain with ore. And he gave, he gave us, when we participate with him, together, we're better together with, with, to love him with heart, soul, mind, and our strength that we work together, not against each other, not reactionary, not in despair, that we work together, together to do His will. And if there's some things that God won't do for us, but He won't do without us, not only is it thinking, not only is it working, but praying, praying. If ever there were a time For thoughts and prayers. And turning away from evil and, and turning toward God. This is that time. This is that time that in the presence of evil, we might, we might move forward toward God, not toward evil, not toward the anger or the despair. So Jesus tells a story here. He follows this up with a story that we read this morning about a man who had a fig tree. The fig tree was three years old, but it, hadn't, it didn't bear any figs, no fruit at all. So the man said, well, and fig trees are expected to bear fruit after three years. Well, so the man said, why is it taking up the ground? Just cut it down. He tells the, the gardener to cut it down. And the gardener intercedes for the tree. And he says, not yet. I'll dig, I'll fertilize, I'll water. I'll tend to this tree. Evil is real. But Jesus intercedes for you and for me. And the power of evil is real. But Jesus intercedes for you and for me. It's what he did on the cross. 
He killed the power of evil once and for all on the cross. It doesn't mean that it's not real. It just means that evil has no power over you and me to control our lives. So repent, turn away from being transfixed to the evil and, and, and turn toward God because we've got a gardener and his name is Jesus and he intercedes for us and he calls us to repent and think. Repent and work. Repent and pray that we're better together. When he rose from the grave, he rose that his spirit, his Holy Spirit, might live in you and me. And that the thinking we do, it's not alone. It's Jesus, the gardener. He's not thinking for us, but he won't think without us. It's Jesus, the gardener. He, he won't work for us but he won't work without us. And it's Jesus. It's Jesus that we meet in prayer today, now in worship. This morning it may be that uh, the recent events have been like a, a kick in the stomach, that it, it's, it's, it's taken away your energy it's understandable. It's a natural reaction. Or it may be that, that immediately you re react in anger. It's a natural reaction. But God didn't call us to just do what's natural. He called us to his son, Jesus Christ, that he might live his life through us. And I want to pray with you now. Join with me in prayer. Let's pray. Jesus, this day, we need strength that comes from you because it's so easy for us to, to keep our eyes on, on the evil. This morning, grant us strength enough, grace enough to repent, to turn, turn toward you, to turn away from that that would bring us to despair, bring us to, to anger, bring us to conflict, that we turn toward you. And Lord, together, that you help us discern your will for our lives, not for somebody else's life, but for our lives. And we begin to move toward you as we think, as we work, and as we pray. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create Humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. 
I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you. Thank you.